Morning, friend. I'm Pastor Jamie, lead pastor here at Faith. We are committed to life transformation, loving God, loving others, and loving our community. And so we love, lift, and launch people into purpose. We strive to help, encourage, support those in our church and in our community. We are so glad you've joined us today. Our prayer for you is that this service blesses and encourages you. Speaking of prayer, we're here for you. If you would like someone to pray for you at any time in the service, just leave a comment or call the number provided and one of the pastors will reach out. Also, feel free to join us encouraging and praying for one another. Connect and comment, reach out. If you're joining us for the first time, then please comment below. We'd love to welcome you personally. Have a great morning, everyone. care how late you stay out. Stay out as late as you want. You want to borrow the new car? You want to borrow my credit card? Kids today, they really have it rough. I have no idea where we are or where we're going. I mean, when I was their age, life was easy. Super easy. Why haven't you gotten a tattoo yet? How come you don't have any piercings yet? Yep, we're lost. We are completely lost. Ooh, sports. It, it, just do whatever the mechanic says to do. Vehicle maintenance is completely overrated. Look, whatever the mechanic is asking, just pay him. Pay him whatever he wants. I wish they had soap operas at night. I like that boy. You should date him. You should date him immediately. Well, what about the creepy guy with the motorcycle? He's cute. Yeah, sure. Spring break in Tahiti sounds fun. Hey, make sure you get all your video games done before you start your homework. You don't have to pass all your classes. What? You have a project due tomorrow and you've known about it for four weeks and you haven't started yet? Sweet! Doesn't anybody want to know if we're there yet? Remember, if you need anything between midnight and 4 a.m., please come wake me up. Hey, I'm on the phone. Could you bring the baby over and let him climb all over me? Hey! Hey! Can you please turn that music up? Well, we just stopped for lunch 10 minutes ago, but yeah, let's stop again. I never have trouble with my toddler. I never have trouble with my teenagers. I never have trouble with my adult children. You know, she's right. We are ruining her life. Yes, more homework to correct. All right, whining. Yay, tantrums. Mmm, vomit. We just really need to spoil these kids more. Sorry, buddy. I don't know any good jokes at all. You're 16. You pretty much know everything now. I think 18 is a great age to get married. Okay, remember, make sure you turn on all the lights before you leave the house. Hey, could you leave the front door open for a couple hours? Thanks. Whoa, money really does grow on trees.
Well, good morning. Happy Father's Day to all the dads. We're going to praise Jesus, sing about our Heavenly Father now.
is so good. He loves us so much. There's no love like the Father's love. Yes, Jesus. From the darkness, from the darkness, I called your name. Into darkness, your mercy came. You called me out, lifted me up. How great is your love. You bore my weakness, you took my shame. Buried my burdens in fields of grace. You called me out, lifted me up. How great is your love from the heights.
God, we thank you for your love that we can't even fathom, God. We worship you. And we declare right now that there is nothing better than you. And there is no one greater than you. And there is no one who can do what you can, Jesus.
nothing is better than our God. There is nothing, there is no one who is greater than our God. No one is greater than Jesus. I was, uh, I was reading this week, and I got to the last two chapters of the Bible. And uh, in Revelations 21, it starts to talk about the end of it. When everything's done, what God was working towards. And John says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. The whole point of it, everything is being with God, where there is no more pain and there is no more suffering. No matter what valley you're looking at, God is a God who brings life and brings restoration and brings hope. He's the one who turns mourning into dancing, shame into glory, gives beauty for ashes. He's the one who uh, brings graves into gardens. He's the one who turns bones into armies. He's the one who turns seas into highways. There is no one like our God. This morning, you might have a prayer request and we want to pray with you because there is no one like our God and no one can do the things that he can do. If you have a prayer request, comment that on the, uh, on the comment section on Facebook. If you say, you know what, I really need prayer, there's a phone number, it's on your screen. That's the phone number for the church office. You can call that and someone will pray with you right now and after the service as well. Let's just take a minute and pray. Heavenly Father, you are the great one. You, you make a way when there seems to be no way. You bring restoration, you bring redemption, you bring victory, you bring triumph. You lead us through valleys into your presence. And God, for every need that we, we have connected to this church this morning, you know every one of them, and you care for every single person that is going through it. So God, I ask that they would feel your peace and your presence, that they would know your hand at work and experience your great healing power. God, we ask that you would move miraculously in each one of these needs as we bring them to you. God, you are the God who is great and there is nothing, there is no one better than you. In Jesus' name, amen. We have some announcements for you. Good morning, Faith Mullen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, we just are so glad that you are here. I have a few announcements for you. So first off, our VBS is still happening this year. We've changed the date in order to make sure we provide everyone with a wonderful day camp. Please mark down August 17th to 21st for our Rocky Railway Adventure. Each child will be receiving an individual pack with all of their supplies and snacks. We cannot wait to see you there. Um, happy Father's Day to all of the dads and all of the men of influence. To honor you, we have made a donation to Elisha House. A reminder today is the last day to donate to the Elisha House Baby Bottle Campaign. Please visit elishahouse.on.ca for more information. The first online session of Growth Track will be starting this Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. Growth Track is where you will learn more about Faith Welland, our vision, our leadership structure, and how and where you can get involved. Please contact Pastor Dave at davidfaithwelland.com for the Zoom login ID. As well, information about how you can continue to give during this season will be posted to our Facebook page later this afternoon following the service. Thank you so much for your faithful giving during this time. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day.
Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Happy Father's Day to the best pop ever. Happy Father's Day. We want to honor all dads, um, especially my dad and my husband. Great dad. The person that I would like to say Happy Father's Day to today is my pop. I'm so thankful for everything that he has done. I'm thankful that my dad has supported me in everything that I've done and has always been there when I need someone to talk to. Thank you so much for being a spiritual leader to me. Thank you for being such a great example of God's love to us. Thanks for always putting us first, Dad. Thank you for making money so we can go on family trips. Thank you for getting us me dogs because they're really cute. I wouldn't be the man I am today without my father in my life. I'm so blessed to have him in my life. I will always be your treasure. We appreciate all the fathers out there. Thanks for everything you do. Happy Father's Day, Pappy! Mm -hmm. Hey dads, you know it's really good to see you. I know you may not hear this a lot, but uh, we love you. And we hope you understand how important and how special it is that you're here. You know, there's probably a hundred things you could be doing today, but you're here with us. And it means a lot. You don't have an easy job. Parenting comes with incredible challenges. And sometimes it's hard to know if you're doing it right. But you should know that being here right now, it's an important part. In the Old Testament, God gave this command, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. These words that I command you today should be on your heart. You should teach them diligently to your children. You should talk of them when you sit in your house or when you're walking down the street. Talk of them from the time you get up in the morning to when you fall asleep at night. So what does it mean to be a good father? It means loving God with all of your heart, soul and mind and teaching your kids to do the same. And what an amazing example it is that you're here in the house of God, in the presence of other believers, seeking more of Jesus and worshiping unashamed. The young men and women here see you. The kids are watching. And as they grow, they'll remember and do the same. So thank you, dads. Thank you for your presence and example. We pray that God will bless you today. Renew your spirit and draw you closer to him so you can continue to be a shining influence to all those around you. Happy Father's Day. Thank you, Pastor Shane and Mike and worship team for leading us today. Well, we have been uh, started a series last week, our summer series on doors, and um, we discovered that we have... Fi uh, Actually, 15 doors in the sanctuary. We discovered one more, Austin. The drum cage door was not counted in our total count. So uh, it wasn't 14. For those that guessed 15, you were right. Sorry, those that guessed 14, you were wrong. Um, we plan on opening these doors, and uh, we're looking forward to it. We've got a, uh, information finally from Ontario government, some guidelines of churches that choose to reopen, how they need to, uh, how they need to reopen. We see that... Uh, that was publicized on Monday. We got it on around Wednesday. We compared it to our plan, and so we're preparing for two trial services. Uh, one next week for just a few people. Listen, if I were building a ferry boat to carry a thousand people, I would not just put them on the boat as soon as the boat was made. I want to make sure that it floats first. So we're going to float this boat with just a few people next week, a few volunteers, staff, and, uh, and just to see how things work. And then the second trial service will be on July 5th. And we'll be opening that up to everybody. You will need to register for that service. And um, the great thing is that's a God Story Sunday, so we'll be celebrating getting together as well as just celebrating everything God's done in the past three months. Just because we haven't been able to get through these doors to meet here does not mean God has been sitting on the sidelines. He has been still working. And so we will be celebrating gathering together in the trial service on July 5th. 
and also celebrating what God's done. And then we'll take the information uh, from those two services, the guidelines, and then, and then we will look at a feasible plan for reopening as well. We, um, today is Father's Day, and, uh, and the series that we're doing on doors, we're putting these two together, and we're looking at the doors of our homes. Originally, I thought about doing in the Passover, back when uh, they put the blood on the doorposts of the homes, but was, was directed to a portion of the service and the sermon that, that really started to become the main focus, and that was Deuteronomy chapter 6. So if you want to turn there, that's where we're going in a few moments. Now, if you're watching this and you're not a, a father, that's okay. Today we're honoring men and fathers, but uh, the principles in Deuteronomy chapter 6 are transferable to singles, to single moms, to if you have no children, if, if you're a young adult. These are excellent principles for following in God's way. So here's the question for today, and um, see if you can come up with this one. How many doors... Do we have going into and inside the men's washrooms in the church? See if you can figure this one out. Okay, so there is nine, nine in the men's washroom. We are working towards, and I hope to, by the end of the series, have the question, total amount of doors in the church, but we'll, we'll wait for that one, and we're gonna do it piece by piece until we get there. A young woman brought her fiance home to meet her parents for the first time. After dinner, the, the mother leaned over to the father and said, uh, See if you can find something out about the guy. So the mother and the daughter go into the kitchen and the father says, hey, why don't we go into the study? The young man follows him, totally oblivious to what was about to happen, the 20 questions he was about to get. They sat down and the father said, so what are your plans? The young man said, well, I'm a, I'm a Bible scholar. Bible scholar. Hmm, Great. So what are you going to do to provide a home for my daughter? I will study, the young man said, and, uh, and, and God will provide for us. Oh, what about, how do you plan on buying an engagement ring? Well, um, I will concentrate on my studies, and God will provide, the young man said. The father kept asking questions. The young man kept answering. Don't worry, sir. God will provide. And on and on, every question, God will provide. Later on that night, the young man had gone home and uh, the mother and father were talking and the the mother asked, so how did it go, honey? Father said, well, he has no job and no plans, but there is good news. He thinks I'm God. uh, None of us are perfect. We all have our, our worries, our frustrations, our challenges. And there is only one real perfect father. But the truth is, this world could use a few more good men. Men, fathers are in a position of influence, but we live in a culture and a time that, that is very, very demanding on our priorities. It's a complicated world, it's a demanding world, and, and if we're not careful, we can lose our way, we can lose our focus, we can start concentrating on things that are not important, not as important as some of the priorities that we will see explained today in God's word. It's critical in such a culture that we have a clear understanding of what God expects of us. Our success in teaching our kids, in raising our children, has a lot to do with how we set our priorities and whether we put God first in our life. Someone asked George Bush, 
What is your greatest accomplishment? What was your greatest accomplishment? George Bush said, well, uh, I mean, he could have said uh, when he was a World War II Navy pilot. He could have said uh, one of his greatest accomplishments when he was eight years as a vice president, second chair to Ronald Reagan. Or maybe he could talk about his presidency or the fact that he was the head of CIA or the ambassador to China at one point. He could talk about Desert Storm, but he didn't. When, when George Bush was asked, what was your greatest accomplishment, here's what he said. That my children still come to see me. What a statement. There's no greater place in ministry for us as fathers than in our homes. Now, I, uh, I've written a note later on just uh, during worship that I, I've even felt like I need to put here. I felt impressed to just share, if you are estranged from your father or estranged from your children, that God can help, God can intervene, God can build bridges. He's a God who reconciles. Our Heavenly Father sent His Son so that we might reconcile to Him. And revival, as it talks about with Elijah and John the Baptist, is a revival that not only restores the relationship with God and us, but it turns men's heart towards their children and children's hearts towards their fathers. I'm praying that for you there would be reconciliation today. What are some qualities of a good father? Another little discussion question for us. What makes a man a good man? Discuss. James Dobson said in his book, Dare to Discipline, that good fathers are not born, they're made. And he describes three specific things that a good father needs to keep in mind. Number one, a good father needs to keep in mind and understand that they are leading, that there are people who are following. Mind your step. Because others are going the same way you go. Number two, a good father keeps in mind that he should love their children's mother. Love God, but make sure you display a love for your wife and a respect for women. Husbands, love your wives, Paul says in Ephesians 5. Just like Christ loved the church. And thirdly, spend time with your children. This sounds like obvious, but again, it's sometimes it's just good to be reminded of what's important, what matters. Yes, we need to love God and, and we need to have good marriage. We need to spend time with the next generation. If you might not be a father, can I challenge you? Take the time to spend time with others a generation other than your generation. There is immense value in spending time with the generations that have gone before you and incredible value in spending time with the generations that would follow. Take the time. There is no gift like presence. We need men to pass on the what, the why, and the how of following Jesus. Paul took on the role of, of father. It says in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 4, 13, and on through the 16. I'm going to specifically read from verse 15. Even if you had 10,000 guardians or teachers in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. 
In the, in the medieval days, they had a, a threefold pattern to learning. The, the trivium. Number one, the first stage for a child that's grades, for instance, grades zero to four, would be the grammar stage. They're just learning to talk, learning to have conversation. This is when you teach the what. The second stage is the why stage, the logic stage. It's what we would call uh, primary or junior grades, sorry, the grades five to eight. And then teaching the how, the rhetoric stage, grades nine to 12. As I relate that just before we go into our Deuteronomy 6 text, maybe this is the way we need to teach children the things of God. First of all, the what? Very early. When do you start teaching a child about the things of God? As soon as they start to speak and even before. Studying God's word and studying God. Talking about his attributes, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Ten Commandments, Psalm 23, the Lord's Prayer, the cross, helping them to hear and know and memorize Scripture, giving them a foundation. Have a conversation. It's the building block for their future years. And then, and we've all had this, when your children all of a sudden discover how to use the question, why? It's not just because they want to torment you. Why? 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 It's because they've begun to develop an ability to reason. A child that's in this stage, especially with the things of God, they just won't know, this is what we're going to do. We go to church on Sunday. That's what we do. They want to know, why are we going to church? This is what we do. We sing. Why do we sing? We raise our hands. Why do we raise our hands? We read the Bible. Why do we read the Bible? They want to know the why. We need to engage the next generation in this conversation. We need to explain the why. And if you don't know the why... All the better. Take the journey together. Discover together. And by the way, because we've always done it that way is not an answer. We need to know our why. The how. Now this is different than just telling them what to do. This is the the practical. It's teaching by not just educating, but it's experience as well. Application and observation, doing things together. I love how Jesus taught the disciples. They followed him, they saw, they received teaching, education, but they received experience and example as well. In the Hebrew tradition, legacy is super important. Passing down from one generation to the next generation. What is the best way to guide people in the right path? The word of God. It is the great guide. It's the track. Today we're going to explore a command from God in Deuteronomy chapter 6. There's actually two commands of of this nature. Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 11. We're going to land in Deuteronomy 6 verses 1 to 9. Actually we're going to move on a a few verses past that. This is where the people of God were challenged to post the word of God on the door posts of their home. We need men to set out to live right before God. In the first few verses of Deuteronomy, describes the rails that God gives some instructions. Now, before I read the scripture, my mind came to Tomorrowland, if you've ever been to Disney and Tomorrowland, that's the one where it has the race cars. I remember the first time I went there as a little wee guy, felt like I was really driving a race car. And you know, it's that one, it's the race car where you can actually steer the car, but it's all on a great big rail. And you can feel right or left all you want, but really, you can't crash into anything else, you can't hurt yourself, because it's all on a rail. You have control, but there are limits. God has a plan for your life. He's got direction. There are rails. These are the commands, verse 1 to 3. Decrees and laws the Lord your God directed me, Moses said, to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess. So that you, your children, 
and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all these decrees and commands that I give you. And so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and so that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. These few verses speak to a very important issue for us as adults. That if we are going to influence the next generation, if we want to bless the next generation, then we ourselves need to follow the way that's right. Let me ask you, if success of my home begins in my relationship with God, I'm going to ask a very, it's a rhetorical question, we're not going to have a discussion slide or anything, but ask yourself this question. Am I following God's plans for my life? We will never be able to lead the next generation in the way that they need to go if we've not gone there ourselves. This is the the what, the how, and the why right here. The what, we bring our lives under God's leadership. We do what's right. We, We are the example. The reaction, how? Well, God has standards. And so this is how we are going to follow out those standards. This is what it's going to look like, and we will live that example. No better witness than than a, a mother or a father taking the Bible seriously. And then the reward. This is the why. That God is faithful. He promised Israel blessing. He made a promise. He said, I will complete my promise. Made a a covenant with them. Children need to see that God will do what he said he will do. That he is faithful. He keeps his promises. Let's show the next generation that God is the only way to live in serving him. Obedience pays off. God's way is the best way. So, speaking of rails, and maybe this is a good discussion one. Describe a time when you were glad that you had rules or boundaries in your life because they saved you. Discuss. We need men to make loving God their number one priority. Verse 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This may seem like it doesn't have a lot to do with Father's Day, but this is the heart of the matter. Before we can be ever successful parents, we have to have the matter of our own relationship with God nailed down. It's important to live right, but it's also important to love right. Children need to know that we not only do what God wants us to do, they need to know that we love God. They need to know that God loves us. They need to see us making Him our priority. It used to be our focus. No other gods before him. Too often, though, the next generation sees their parents and adults that have gone before them putting everything else ahead of God. We put our jobs, our hobbies, our friends, our activity, our resting. We put everything in front of God. When we do that, we are establishing an idol. We are showing the next generation And telling them by our actions that we love these things 
more than God. That is why it's so important we love God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. The next generation just doesn't need the rules. They need to see people passionately following after the things of God, passionately loving him and walking in relationship with him. Next generation needs to see that no one comes before us in our relationship with God. He should be our fixation. We need to be locked into the track, our heavenly father and his way for our life. He motivates everything we are and everything we do. I encourage you to have your children answer these questions. Do you know that I love you? Do you know that God loves you? Do you love God? And finally, how are you going to show others God's love? Our love for him should consume us totally. The next generation needs to see some on fire, sold out, radically obedient disciples of Jesus that love God with everything they've got. That is contagious. Yes, give them the rules, give them the study, have them understand, teach. But first, we need to display an all out love for God. Laying track. See, it's not just to be on track ourselves, but recognize that we are laying track for the next generation. We need men to love God's word. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts, verse 6. Do you love God? And secondly, do you love God's word? Do you treasure it? Do you go to it when you need advice? Do you, do you search it when you're trying to find an answer? Do you feed on it? Do you share it? The word is to be in me. and is to change me. One more time of discussion. Would you share a verse right now that is important to you? So important that if you are If you have generations that are following you, what would be a verse that you would want to share to a generation that follows you? Discuss. Some good verses there. I was thinking what I would share here. A couple of them I want to give now. Number one would be from the story of Samson. A great story to tell the next generation. Especially a young man serving God, big, strong, powerful, but recognizes all his might meant nothing if he didn't have a relationship with Jesus. It's a relationship, the Spirit's anointing on his life that gave that man power. And he screwed up. He, he, he messed up. Lost it, lost his strength, lost his influence, lost his position. I would want the next generation to know the verse, though, that says, but the hair on his head grew back. And if you've made a mistake, hair grows back. Nothing's ever permanent. Scriptures like, I am with you always, or, or the verse in Romans 12 and 2, Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? Because then you will test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You want to know God's plan for your life. Don't just follow the patterns of this world. But renew your mind with God's word. You will find yourself discovering God's plans. If I expect my life to impact the next generation, then I need to be transformed by the word myself. Nothing can happen through me unless it happens in me. 
treasure the word of God, not just on your mouth, but have it on your heart. Laying track, we need men who will share God's word by explanation and example. Verse 7 and 9, it says, Impress them on your children. Talk about, this is the word of God, talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Here it is. Write them on the door frame of your houses and on your gates. They're to write the word of God on their foreheads and on their hands. On their foreheads because that is where we think. Filter everything you think. Contrast it and compare it to the word of God. And on your hands. May everything we do be filtered through the word of God. And then the doorposts and gates. They're literally supposed to have their lives labeled with the word of God. And then, as a reminder, put it on the door frames. It is necessary to be reminded again and again and again of God's word. I'm stepping on toes here. But 1% of a child's time, approximately according to statisticians, is spent under the influence of the church. 7% under the influence of a school system, and 92% under the influence of home. We need homes that are dedicated to God and in His way. Homes that have on their doorposts labeled the Word of God. Homes that have parents and leaders who has the Word of God on their hands and on their forehead that they think, they do, everywhere they go is saturated with the Word of God. Doors are such an important item. They keep things out and they keep things in. You appreciate the symbol for Israel when you appreciate the function of a door. Everything that will exit or enter this home passes by the word of God. It is the tracks. God's word must be so common that it is actually just natural part of everyday life. Every time Israel got off track, it's clear. They lost God's word or ignored it or failed to teach it to the next generation. We are to diligently teach the word of God not just by explanation, but by example. Have it on our forehead, on our hands, and on the doors of our homes. Backtrack, one final point. We need to share, have men to share what God has done. Now, verses 10 to 12 is not referring to a memory problem in in forgetting God. It's, It's referring to forsaking God. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large, flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant, then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. We are to keep God's commands. We're to follow after God's way, and God will bless those who are faithful. But when he does bless, make sure you do not forget that anything that you have that's good and great and blessing and what you enjoy right now, you are not a self-made man. You are a God-made man. It's important for passing this on to the next generation. If we promote a self-made man, we'll only push the next generation to feel like they need to achieve for themselves. We emphasize that we are a God-made man. We emphasize God. I'm going to have the worship team come up. When we enter or exit the door of our home, we need to be reminded to be obedient to the word of God. The next generation depends on it. What are you doing to pass on faith to the next generation? Well, here it is. We need to return to God's word, to God's ways. We need a returning to God.
And and today I'm talking specifically about men. If you're listening to this today, and you might say, I've gotten off track. Well, today is the day to get back on track. I referred to it earlier, Elijah and John the Baptist. It's never too late to get back on track. Do it now. And there's no better way than to start getting back on track with your relationship with God. If you were here at this moment right now, I would have you come forward so we could pray together. Because I honestly, as preparing for this service today, that there was someone listening to this that you know you have gotten off track. You have, I'll, I'll give you this example, I've given this example before. But in life, there are, there are rails, there are boundaries, there are warning signs. We're driving down the road, and if we start getting off track, there are rumble strips. We can hear it going, rah, 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 rah. we're getting off track. There's the gravel, you can feel it move off the road. There's the ditch. There's, long before that, there was the signs. There's the guardrails. But if you say to yourself, you know what, you go into the rumble strips, not a big deal. It doesn't seem that bad. I'm still driving. I'm still, it's not infecting my speed at all. Even into the gravel, a little bit squirrely, but I can figure it out. You've been going through warning signs. You know you're getting off track. You know you're not going in a direction where you need to know. And you know that if you continue to go in that direction, it will not lead you in a way that's not only God-honoring, but not in a way that's beneficial for anybody that's in your life. Then stop now. Get back on track. You can't keep blowing through all these warning signs. If you do, eventually it heads to the cliff. Today is the day to turn things around. I'm not sure where you are today, what the situation is, but the good news is that God is a God who forgives. As I said earlier, hair grows back. Even for those that have forsaken him, he sent his son Jesus to die to call us back. If you're watching now, and God's been speaking to you, you would like someone to pray with you as if you would have come forward, then you can call that line right now or leave a message on the Facebook. We'll have someone contact you. If you're watching this later on during the week, then please just send an email, call the number that's on on the Facebook live feed, call the church. We we would love to, to pray with you. But for those who are watching live, would you join me in prayer right now? And if God's been speaking to you about getting back on track, then make this your personal prayer. Heavenly Father, we recognize that we often like to go our own way. And many times that We are able to find our way back, but sometimes we go so far, we lose our way. I am thankful that you are the great shepherd that comes looking for us. I'm thankful that you're still that God, that when Adam sinned, your next thing was not a statement, wasn't chastisement, wasn't rebuke. Your next thing you spoke was a question. Adam, where are you? A question of relationship. A question to draw him unto yourself. To the person today that has gone astray. You're calling names today, Heavenly Father. Someone's hearing your name. Like Samuel last week, we hear the name. We come, we say, speak, God, your servant's listening. For those that have gotten off track, we just say, God, we've gotten off track. We've made other things the priority in our life, but we're coming back today. I need to get back on track, and I'm starting with my relationship with you. I'm surrendering to you. Guide me, lead me, and help me lead. In Jesus' name, amen. So it says in verse 13 and 14, if you faithfully obey the commands I'm giving you today, to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will 
send rain on your land in its season, both autumn and spring rains, so that you may gather in your grain new wine and olive oil. I will provide grass in the fields for your cattle, and you will eat and you will be satisfied. Passing on blessing is so important. And so passing on the key to blessing is just important. Obedience and faithfulness to God. The blessing of faith lived out from generation to generation. As you sing this song, let's sing it together. Be challenged to live in obedience to God so we might see generations and generations of God's blessing. Worship team will lead us. Lord bless you and keep Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Lord, bless you and keep you. Make his face 
As you go into your world. May you love your children like God loves his children. May you find your identity in being a son of the only perfect father. May you make it possible, make it impossible for your daughters to ever find a husband as good as their dad. May you teach your children that their mother is the most beautiful woman alive. She's really pretty. May you risk more, worry less, and play hard. May you lead your family, not as a king, but as a servant. Who protects their heart, protects their hearts. little things, the little things. And finally, and finally, may you lay down your life for your family. And may you introduce them to a God, to a God that's already done that exact thing. We hope that you have a great day today. Great day today. Have a great day today. Happy Father's Day. 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 Happy Father's Day.